point. Otherwise, I think we can just sort of start the discussion and, and go from there. Um, so obviously you guys know me. Hi, I'm Gertie. <laughs> um, I'll be kind of co-facilitating today and taking notes. Um, and I am really interested in this topic. I do have a, a bunch of friends that are teachers or looking to become teachers. And, um, you know, Connor, the co-founder of Fireside at Five, his sister is also a teacher and specifically kind of deals with kids um, kind of with special needs or um, who have some learning disabilities. So I think this will be a really important conversation that we can hopefully help a lot of other people with um, some tips on. So that's kind of my spiel. That's my intention for today is to kind of learn from all of you guys and um, hopefully come up with a good list of uh, tips that we can sort of start sending out to other uh, teachers, educators, instructors who might be struggling right now. Um, Lauren, do you want to do your intro? Sure. Hi, I'm Lauren and um, Lauren Deutsch, Lauren Academic Services. I, so I, when I was thinking about this originally as like a four part series, this was the one that sort of occurred to me would be helpful in terms of like, what are we radically doing different right now due to the pandemic? Or what are we sort of, you know, were we back on our heels as a society or as an educational you know, group in terms of like readiness to be online or readiness to, to shift a curriculum? And it, what interested me was that at the time when all of this was going on, I was working in um, on campus at the medical school, and there was a need to very quickly shift things around and rewrite, you know, plans and rewrite curricula and so forth. And I, it was a pretty daunting task, to be honest. And so it, it occurs to me that like it was so timely to think about it. And then as we started to see teachers in K through 12 or higher ed professors, et cetera, you know, really just completely having to renovate curricula on the fly and dealing with issues like access to the technology or access to consistent technology, um, you know, it occurred to me this would be a, a good time to have this type of conversation. So my goal is to get out of it, um, you know, what it is like, for example, as a student, what it's like as a learning specialist, what it's like individually for people. and, and it, personally as a parent, which I am as well, you know, what it's been like on my end too. So I'm interested in hearing people's stories about this. And I, obviously the articles will, we can get into when we move on to that, so. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> sounds good. Raina, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Um, okay, so I know all of you from last week. Uh, I'm Raina. This uh, topic actually is kind of near and dear to my heart because um, it's something that I've always found myself trying to uh, encourage, but I get a lot of, um, when I was working as a teacher, I was getting a lot of resistance. And then I started going into working towards my doctorate and the classes that I found myself gearing towards were more about creativity, innovation. They were talking about technology. And now, as it turns out, I... Um, I'm actually in a new program and it's leadership in creativity and innovation. And it's, it's all about what we're talking about right now. So it's exciting for me. I mean, this has been a kind of stressful time simply because of the stay at home shelter in place. But as an educator, this is really exciting because people have had no choice but to convert their curriculums to a more technological, innovative fashion. And for me, this is exciting. I really am. I'm thrilled about this. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Jillian, would you like to go next? Yeah, I'm Jillian, a second year medical student. I met you guys all, well, Lauren I've known and the other two I've met for the past two or three weeks. Um, so I came, before I came to medical school, I was an elementary school teacher for nine years, almost 10 years. And uh, so education for me is very interesting of a topic, um, especially when we talk about access, sort of like what we've been talking about um, in the other talks with regards to access to healthcare. You know, there's also the access to technology, access to uh, various learning modalities within the curriculum. And I always taught in um, urban settings. And so this has been really interesting to me to see how I don't know uh, how 
it is exciting in one sense, but I think that it's also going to create a wider divide that already exists between um, like haves and have nots for people who don't have computers and people who don't have internet or you know steady internet, which is something that I struggle with. Um, and then the other part that I was really interested in talking about is how um, in terms of innovation, you know, so like people, it, the the the, te the educators have been begging for years for computers for you know better technology and it's always been like oh we don't have money we don't have resources sorry just make do and now all of a sudden they had no choice and they've bought so many computers to make sure that every student has them and so it sort of makes me wonder like well if you have that money now why didn't you have it you know when the teachers were on strike just a few months ago and they were saying no we need all of these things and it was like this big like no we don't have the money and now because they had no choice they did have the money so i think that that's also an interesting piece to it um but Overall, like looking at the positive side of it, I really think this is an awesome way to learn. I think that most people ha do have access even to basic cell phones and things. And I think that it's a, it's a really cool way to be able to connect communities across the world and across you know, the United States. I know um, I did several programs with groups of students in California with my groups of students in Connecticut and they you know talked using social media and all these things. And so I, I think that it's really exciting because you're able to really broaden the experiences if assuming all the resources are there you're really able to broaden the experiences of who your students are able to interact with which i think is awesome i appreciate that perspective sorry card i didn't oh, mean no. to i was going to add too to your comment about like you know all of these places maybe having the money and the resources to make these things happen sooner but it takes a pandemic for funding to come through that feels like kind of a bummer. And um, personally, I'm, I'm kind of dealing with a similar situation um, where, you know, like I work in marketing and I've been asking for an, an additional person on our team to help with resources. And it, it took a pandemic for them to take it seriously. And it really does make you kind of, it, it shows true colors. It also is sort of like, if you've had the money all along, why didn't you do anything with it before? Um, and that kind of question goes all the way up to the government as well with like, all of the you know trillion dollar stimulus packages that we're doing it's like if money is just kind of something we can create out of thin air then why don't we make it opportunistic for everybody <laughs> right i mean that's a way different kind of question and topic that's a different chat but i did want to add to your comment on that well and i'm going to add another one to it um to encourage a lively discussion the other thing that i've noticed is that even when the technology has been brought in how many teachers actually integrate it within their curriculum? I mean, that's really, for me, what I've noticed because I have actually worked in two schools that were one-on-one -on -one and or BYOC or bring your own device, BYOD as they called it, which was ironic because that was the name from a Christian school. But um, it, it was really interesting that even though the technology was presented, even though the students had their laptops every single day or their Chromebooks or whatever, how many actual teachers used it? I mean, that is what I noticed. And to me, that's actually the worst because the parents are making the investment or the districts making the investment. And the, when they're not being used, that's sad. It's interesting what you're saying, Reina. I think when I was in graduate school, you know, many years ago, what my first degree was in was actually looking at technology in the classroom and whether as educators we are supposed to teach to use the technology, right, so that that has like some purpose, either, you know, means to an end, so to speak, or is it that we can intertwine the learning of the technology, learning how to use it, apply it, et cetera, using it for research, using it to crunch numbers, using it in creative artistic ways to do something and then therefore should be embedded in the curriculum as such, not as a separate tool, but as just simply part of what it is that we do, right, as educators. I'm curious. I, I think it requires both. I think that there is some explicit teaching that needs to go on, especially with the brand new technology. I know when I was an educator learning how to use a smart board, I couldn't have just jumped in. Like I needed <laughs> hours of training because it was it was hard for me and I'm like a tech buff. So I can imagine the, the teachers who weren't struggling even more. 
Um, and then also for the students, I think that it's sort of like what people consider handwriting back in the day. And I know that's a huge complaint that we don't teach handwriting anymore, but um, which I don't agree with. I think we should teach handwriting, but I also think that we need to teach typing because that is what the future is. And if they can't use a keyboard or basic, you know, basic Word or Excel functions, how are they really going to manage in the future? And I think that the earlier we do that, the better. Um, but at the same time, I think that integrating it is a great way for them to learn how to use it. And then they, when they work in small groups, and this is elementary kids, so they're a little bit more plastic and willing to fail and everything. So, um, hi. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's fine. But uh, yeah, I think that that's a great way too, because then what happens is that they see like, oh, you're using those gestures. Show me how you did that. You know, and then it's a much more organic. But I think they come hand in hand. I was going to add, oh, sorry. Did you want to speak, Lauren? Um, I'll write it down and you go. That's I was going to add to that as well, Jillian. I think that we could even take it one step further and teach coding to all of the students. Like, I think like, you know, handwriting is a language that we all needed to learn, you know, typing is another one, but I think the future is also like getting into the back end of these systems and teaching students how to understand the basic languages within coding, like HTML, JSS, like all that, or CSS. I think that stuff is like very much forward futuristic thinking as well. I'm actually taking a class right now, like a slow on my own pace thing learning because I don't know it at all. And I'm like, I need to get into this because it's like, you know, rocketing up and I need to be part of it. <laughs> okay, I was like typing, but I'm jumping in to say this. I think along those lines, this is, I know Jillian and Raina, you've certainly heard me say this before. I, I think in some ways it's very similar with regard to the technology and making sure that educators, teachers, professors are on board in terms of like implementing that within their curriculum. I think it goes hand in hand with the same question or philosophy of how we teach people how to learn, right? Like how we make explicit a more metacognitive process or how we make explicit that sort of learning how to learn or learning how to achieve and getting that piece embedded in the curriculum, not just hey, here's how, you know, we need to learn this content knowledge, or we need to develop our, you know, fundamental knowledge in X, Y, or Z. It's teaching people how to learn how to do that. And I think that's actually where, Raina, to your earlier point, when we think about the technology, if, if teachers are not actually using that within, you know, explicitly within the curriculum that they've designed, and yet now we've all moved on to an online setting for the most part, that's a really big lost opportunity. And so why wouldn't that actually be fundamental to the curriculum, right? Why wouldn't that actually be a component so that it's explicitly taught so that we're like labeling it and modeling it as we go and not just leaving it off to side, which is I need you to turn in a typed paper because that's that doesn't teach yeah. anyone about the, you know, the actual, you know, technology. And to Gert's point, it doesn't teach anybody about programming or something else that you could do to embed something very cool within a report or research project or actually producing something like an app to, you know, engage your, your other learners. Well, and I think modeling is a huge opportunity. And if teachers or educators, professors are resistant to taking on the new innovation, innovative technologies that are presented to them in terms of within the curriculum, then they're missing out on an opportunity of showing how we ourselves as educators learn and how to get over through it, you know, through various systems that we have. I've been doing um, a little bit of research on self-regulated learning and modeling is huge. It's, it's for that others can see how you handle learning yourself. So I think that's excellent. I'm so glad to hear that you're doing that. <laughs> I mean, there's some amazing articles. I, I want to be mindful, first of all, and just welcome Ocean, because I know she came in when we were just in the middle of talking. So um, Ocean, I'll let Gertie introduce you and, and sort of take you through that, and we'll segue into the questions. Yeah, Ocean, um, welcome. I think this might, you've been on a couple of fireside chats before, right? So this isn't your first. Actually, um, this was yesterday. First I've been of creeping on the other one. So, hey, I feel like I know all of you. Uh, but um, this is my first LAS fireside that I get to participate in. So, okay. I'm excited. Um, um, yeah. We did an intro, kind of everybody went around the room and sort of gave a little background about, you know, what they do and what their intention is for today's chat, what they're looking to get out of it. Um, and we'd love to hear 
kind of what you have, what your thoughts are on that and um, a little background about who you are. And then we'll, like Lauren said, we'll get into the discussion questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, I work with Lauren. You guys have uh, probably seen an email or two from me. Um, I, aside from that, I am also, I've been a tutor for a number of years and I am a therapist. I work with children and adolescents. So my clients have all been transitioning to online learning. And for me, just working with the K through like 12 and a half, getting ready to go to college range, it's really interesting to see the variety of ways that are being taught. Like one of my clients has a non-interactive gym class where she's just, they post an agenda and she's just supposed to do yoga or do running and just sort of hearing about that on my end. I'm like, how, like, it, this is the best, we have so much technology, we have so many ways to interact and the best that you're getting is a printed schedule that tells you, yep, yeah, do yoga today. Like, I wouldn't know how to do that if I was told. So just sort of hearing about it in those terms, I'm interested in hearing some of the good things that are going on, some of the things that are being innovated, some of the other stories that we're hearing like that and ways that like we can think to solve issues like that and work with individuals and administrations to package that in a better format than I think some people have been able to package it because I've also heard on the complete flip side a lot of really good things so it's it's been both and I'd say too like Lauren Academic Services has done such a good job of like already transition they were already virtual to begin with so it's something that you guys have experience with already I mean to me it's like creating sort of almost like a Lauren Academic Services guide to teaching online and kind of showing different people like the resources. Like, I think that could be a great blog post one day or an infographic or something that you guys could send out to a lot of school boards and see if they implement some of these strategies. So maybe some of the stuff we come up with today, we can put into that infographic. Nice, very nice. I agree, fabulous. Um, I wanted, I wanted to start by directing you guys to the, like the different articles that we had. Um, and the goal isn't to summarize all of them or anything. You can refer to them as we're going along if you have interest in so doing or in the aftermath, you know, there's links in there and stuff like that. But the first piece I think is just this idea of radical um, change or radical innovation versus a more incremental one. And I think the part about like what happened in, you know, late February, early March, and then all into, you know, middle and late March as schools started to shift to an online platform. Um, we could say in some ways that was a fairly radical shift, right? But whether we were radical in our innovation about it, I think could maybe be a debatable point. So. I guess my first question just for the group is to think a little bit about like, what does it literally mean to you when you think about innovation in education, like an example or something you've done that you've really, you know, feel proud about or something you'd like to see as a student or, or as an educator. So that that's the first question and kind of just think a little about that and, and uh, yeah, what is the, what does innovation mean to you in, ed in education? And it's a hard question. <laughs> I have an answer. Um, so I kind of mentioned this before uh, that I used, you know, technology when I was a teacher to connect students from Connecticut to California. And how this came about was that I had a really good friend who was super into technology and he was a graphic designer. And so he taught graphic design to high school students and his population where he lived, where he lived is called Thermal, California. It's so hot, it's called thermal. So I can't even imagine how hot that is. But he was looking for ways to get his students to be able to practice their English. And then meanwhile, I'm an elementary school bilingual teacher all the way in Connecticut, and we were really good friends. And so we came up with this idea over the summer that maybe we should start some sort of interaction. And then not only would it help our students be able to practice their English, but they also, if they needed to have somebody who they could speak Spanish with, because they were all Spanish speakers, and also it allowed his students who typically felt like less than because there were these, you know, 
underachieving bilingual students who had come here much later in life. But here we were giving them an opportunity to be like the adults and the cool ones and the bigger ones, you know. And so um, how we ended up doing it was that my students filled out a questionnaire of things that they liked. And then their final senior project was that they had to create on the um, like whatever software he used. I'm not a design person, but whatever software it was, they created a book about that and then they sent them back. And so then at the end of the year, all of my students had a book made that was like about their own life and everything that was their own favorites. And it was awesome. I actually have some, I'm gonna send you guys some at some point. But, um, it, and, and then, you know, they only spoke a few times throughout the year, but it was just a way for them to be able to interact with students and see that they weren't alone. I think that one of the things of coming to a brand new country is that you can feel very isolated and seeing that these other students who were bigger than them or smaller than them were doing it, I think, you know, gave a lot of um, empowerment to them and to see that it was happening all the way across the United States. So it wasn't just them in an isolated community. So that was one way I think that uh, we were pretty innovative. I love the I love the way you're framing this, Jillian. When I first started out in education a really long time ago, I actually worked for the federal government in um, OERI, which was the Office of Education Research and Instruction. And the first project I ever worked on, this is how old I am, the first project I worked on was actually bringing internet and email into the classroom. And the teachers like near and far, urban and rural, et cetera, they were so like against it. And they were like, what would we ever use this for? And that was in the day of dial up, right? So um, it was a really unusual experience because you would wait and wait and wait. And the big question was, well, like, can't I just fax this information quicker? Can't I just pick up the phone and, and tell somebody about it faster? Why do I have to like go through the rigmarole of like an email or, or whatever? And so, you know, it's, I think you're making an important point about what you were doing and, and how that is innovative, right? And something that we kind of almost now take for granted in a technological sense, but the innovation part was not the technology in that case, right? The innovation was how you're turning something on its side in terms of like really fostering, uh, you know, a sense of empowerment and a sense of like, you know, uh, self, um, self-directed learning, I guess, and also self, you know, just self-confidence, self-awareness to be able to say, hey, this is actually an asset that you bring. These are a set of skills that you bring. So yeah, I think one part too that was sort of innovative is that his students typically for their final project felt like humdrum, but this made most of them really want to work hard because they had already had relationships with these students and they knew that they were going to get the books at the end. So I think that that's another really important thing in education is making learning very meaningful. Absolutely agree. I, I'm going to take a moment and pause and just welcome Dorothy Ungerleiter, who's here. I can see her boxes lit up, but we don't see her video and we don't hear her audio quite yet. I know she's um, being awesome and working with Gertie to get on and so forth. So I just want to make a just an acknowledgement and, and say, like, welcome. Dorothy is the founder of the Association of Educational Therapists. She's based in Los Angeles and one of my just most favorite people ever. I have a lot of respect for her and she's written quite a lot and, and taught in, in many, many different ways, places, locations, et cetera, but written quite a lot about um, uh, engaging the learner, a reciprocal curriculum, thinking about organic curriculum and, and so forth. And a lot of what we do at LAS is, is based on a lot of what Dorothy had has written about and taught me over the years and so forth. So I have a lot of just admiration and respect for her. And I know we will see her gradually and, and hear from her as well. Um, Raina, do you want to add about that? I know we were just sort of leaving. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I think the whole thing with innovation and learning doesn't necessarily have to be attached to technology. I think there's a lot of ways that you can be radical with your innovation when you can incorporate something just as Jillian said that is meaningful. Um, the one thing I always was trying to get away from was final exams that were basically standardized just to make it easier on the teacher and I wanted it to be more of a project-based assessment because when you give them a task that they don't know how to figure out but they got to work through 
collaboratively with others. I always had uh, things done in a cooperative environment where they were working with one another. And I think when you do something like that, that is something they might actually, and you know, I taught Spanish, of course, but it was something that they would actually do. Then I thought that that was for me innovative in terms of what I was doing in the classroom. And I find myself even as an academic learning specialist, still bringing in a lot of practices that I used as an educator, because what I'm trying to do is put the onus of learning on the student, not so much of, I mean, yes, I wanna show you some ideas, give you some techniques and everything, but who's the one that's responsible for the learning? And that's why I think it's been a really neat transition for me because I've been able to bring in some, I, I started introducing this thing called a blueprint of success to the students that I've been working with, which is basically a way for them to create goals, to figure out what they need to do to attain those academic goals, the steps that they're gonna take. It's a very self-reflective or self-narrative practice. And I think that that in itself is going to make it more meaningful for the students when they actually achieve their goals. So you can do the same thing in terms of curricular. Uh, you could work with students, have them create goals. What do they want to do? And then design the curriculum around that, meeting whatever the state standards are as well. That's neat. I, and I'm curious, how many students right now are doing that at this point with you? Um, well, I have talked to for sure too. One of them absolutely loves it. The other one, I just kind of introduced it with. And the other students have not responded to my emails. So when I talk to them in person, I will go ahead and have a conversation. But I kind of bring in the whole Jerry Maguire scene when they when he wrote his own mission statement of how best to take care of the athletes. And I said, you know, he looked at what was important, what was relevant. And then of course, that caused him to lose his job, but it helped him to gain his own personal business. And I said, that's what you're doing. You're writing your own blueprint of success. And uh, so far, I think it's a good exercise. Ocean, it looked like you were about to say yeah, something. Yeah, um, Raina, I really liked what you said. Um, for me, I think that innovation is individualizing. Like, I think that there isn't really one without the other. Like, you can't innovate and make it work for everybody unless you're innovating something that is in some way individualized. Like for me, when I'm working with, for my clients right now, part of my innovation has been like, we're typically a solely therapeutic company, not at LAS, my other one. Um, but I have been allowed to also extend tutoring hours because something that we noticed was pretty much immediately once it transitioned to online learning, family difficulties just shot up through the roof. All the progress that we've been making was just completely erased. And a lot of it, I apologize, my dog is about to come screaming into the room. Hello, George. Um, a lot of it was um, about just the progress relative to what they'd done was suddenly being erased because their parents were trying to figure out how to teach them. And when you're already at odds and suddenly you've introduced a giant variable of A, my kid is always here, B, my parent is always here, and C, neither of us really knows what we're doing. Like part of the innovation is just how can we take each person and figure out how to help them and their family teach one another because the way that one of my clients learns is completely different from the way that my other client learns. And so just looking at it from a perspective of innovating individually. I think that's the biggest progress that you can make as an educator. I appreciate that. I think um, I, I, it's it's interesting. I wanna, I wanna sort of weave in what you're both saying, Rena and, and Ocean into um, like whether or not you think we're kind of equipped or set up as a society in this regard. So I, I put the question in the chat for us to sort of think through a little bit more, but the question is, do you think like at the right now today, do are our districts, our states, our federal government or whatever, are the policies that exist currently, are they designed to support innovation, whether that's radical, incremental, et cetera? So like, do they allow for it, right? How much flexibility or latitude is there within that? And then that would be, the question is sort of for teachers, for professors, for educators. And then I think also, what about for students? 
and you know, I think Raina, you were sort of speaking a little bit to that. I know Jillian, you were speaking a little bit to that too. So I think the first question is just in general, are we set up for that at a local level, at a federal level, at a district level? I'm curious what you, what you guys think about that. Um, I think that we are set up for the potential to have it happen, but I don't think that we obviously are ready because when we needed to do it now, it's like a big mess, sadly. Um, I think that there are two things that really frustrate me about that is that um, I don't know if you guys have ever gone on to Harvard and MIT's website, but they have all these like free online courses, right? And so when I was doing my post back, I was taking calculus and I searched for videos to try to help me. And something I came across was a professor from MIT. I think it's like Howard Gross or Herbert Gross, something like that. And his videos are recorded in the 70s. And they are still the ones that they use. They're excellent. They're black and white. He obviously had like an old timey type camera, you know, like actual tape VHS or whatever. But so in the very highest parts of our education, we've been doing this since the 1970s. And here we are so many years later and it's still not set up in a way that everybody has access to that. And I think that that is really terrible. And I think that also there's I mean, um, that's the school like where you would think that would be sort of the 101, right? Harvard, you would kind of think that. Would yeah, no. Fun. And that makes sense because they are the innovators, you know, especially in education. Their their education is really great in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I just don't understand how I understand why back then maybe every school couldn't do that because it was very expensive or whatever. But now with all of the technology that, you know, ha that has advanced so much, you know, and we can see things from outer space, we can see like what's in your pocket, yet somehow everybody can't access the internet, you know? Um, and I think that that is a much more political and socioeconomic topic than it is education. But also when I was an educator, I did a lot of um, critical pedagogy theory. And there was, I forget who wrote the study, but essentially she looked at across like four different socioeconomic um, schools and, at the same grade and looked at like their their rules, their assignments, and just, you know, to see if there was any differences and if so, like what, and essentially what she found is that in the urban or lower class or rural schools, it was really about becoming uh, workers and just fill in the blank. Like, so a ninth grade autobiography assignment was my name is blank. And they just had to write their name on the line. They didn't even have to write the my name is part, you know? And it was completely scripted and they just had to fill in blanks in ninth grade. And then in the really high level class, you know, students were able to just get up at any point they wanted, write their name on the board and go to the library if they wanted to go read something. You know, meanwhile, these other kids only went to the library once a week for 30 minutes and couldn't even check out books. And so in, in the setting where people had more resources, they were really training them to be free thinkers and CEOs and 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 leaders, whereas in the um, poorer communities, they were teaching them to be followers and just follow the rules, don't make noise. It, it really, here it, uh, what is the word? It valued free thinking and creativity and here it valued just being quiet and sitting still. You know, what's interesting is I worked at an inner city school here, an inner city high school. And the one thing I was told was not to give out homework to my students. And I thought, wait a second, you are automatically assuming that they're not capable of doing the homework or they won't follow through. And if we do not set some standards, where are they going to be in comparison to everybody else? And I was told the thing we needed to do was to graduate the students. And so I sadly only lasted at that school for a year because my job was pink slipped, but I refused to do that. I was like, no, these are bright, intelligent individuals who cannot, they, it's not their fault because of their family situation or the financial situation, the economic situation, you know, their racial situation. They are individuals who are bright and capable. And I put a lot of the um, classroom management back on the students. So, I mean, because that's what teachers were basically doing is just babysitters, just make sure that they're able to do this. I extended that way out in my class, we were able to cover a lot of material, but I do think that the state standards here in Illinois, they 
offer a lot of opportunity within what you can do. It's just what the school is going to allow you to do. When you try to demonstrate some innovation, sometimes it gets bucked by the administration. Sometimes it gets bucked by the parents. The students typically want to have projects that are unique and meaningful, but to be able to pursue that, sometimes, you know, it rubs people the wrong way. I think too, something Lauren, that you've always kind of, you know, spoken out about to me is like treating people with respect. So like, if you're a teacher and you're giving your students the same kind of respect that the, you're asking for them to give you, it's kind of the same thing with a workload, right? It's sort of like, I'm holding you accountable to achieve X, Y, Z. I think you're totally able to, to do it. And this is the due date. And this is when it's, you know, we, we're not going to like treat someone differently just because they come from a different background. But I don't know. I'm curious if that's Ocean, you need to yeah, so Lauren, I just saw the uh, question you sent, do uh, public and private schools have different latitude? And uh, having attended both as a youth, I, uh, I think both yes and no. I think there is, I'm also really sorry about my dog. Um, I think that there is the latitude to innovate across an administration in private schools, like I think the administration as a whole can innovate and say, we're gonna do this, or we're gonna do that. Or like, I distinctly remember being in third grade and having a computer class and they um, downloaded copies of Mario teaches typing. And like, you were able to just like type and learn. And then um, I think also within that, there is a pressure for conformity within that administration like we have innovated in this way and that is how we've innovated and no we are not going to make exceptions because your kid is special enough to be here but not special enough to need anything else and then I think within that the alternative of going to public school is there was more innovation between like individual teachers but the system the like the desire to change the system was inflexible like there was it seemed like individual teachers had a bit more latitude to do things with the same curriculum but the institution was very rigid i appreciate what you're saying i jillian and i were talking about this the other day outside of this meeting as i followed up with her and i do want to say she had like this awesome idea, which is like, Lauren, okay, we can talk about this, but like, what are we going to do about all this? And I had a conversation with Alita similarly and a few other people who've joined in these conversations. And I guess I'm, I want to ask this directly to Jillian, because at the moment, I think you are the only student on this call, a current student, which is really cool, as well as an educator. And um, I'm curious about what you think about the question of like, whether your school is supporting you in being innovative and how you're approaching things. I know there are online didactics at UIC. I know there's a lot of work around the transition to um, clerkships and so forth as a you know, rising third year or eventually as that. And then like, what will be happening? I know there's a lot of unknown factors, I suppose, but how, just maybe speak a little bit to that about what kind of, you know, support there is at UIC or at your school for, for student Do you mean day. particularly during the pandemic? Yeah, now and in general, it could be either. So I think that, um, I think they did a great job of being able to offer resources. I think that it took them a while, um, which is understandable because when you have everything ready to go live, then all of a sudden you have to like type out these instructions and, you know, figure out how to, everybody can do it. Um, I think they did a great job given the emergency aspect of it. I also think that at this level, they were much more ahead of the curve because we already have the flipped classroom. So we already have a lot of, you know, things that were online. So we didn't, nobody needed to like figure out, well, how are we going to get them this information? That was all already built into the structure. Whereas if you're talking about schools where you go every day, that's not the case. And so I, I understand that they would have had a much harder time figuring that part out. Um, I think that one of the setbacks with, as with anything, is that uh, for, and this is something that I heard from my peers who are already in M3 rotations. Um, there was one of, one of my best friends is really torn between two different uh, specialties. And so those 
times that she was going to be in the rotation were very important for her because she needed to really decide, like, what do I want to do with my future as a doctor? And that was right when the pandemic hit. And so then it all went online, which even though she felt it was great because she got a lot more one on one attention than she did when she would be in the hospital where people were a lot more busy she didn't actually get to see what those doctors do on a regular basis. And so I think that that's a huge, um, you know, downside to this happening. And again, that's not the school's fault, it's a pandemic. But for the students who are M3s right now, who are really trying to decide what they wanna, you know, major in and focus on, I think it's a real disservice that they don't get to see really a lot of the different sides and that everything is getting cut short because now, uh, it used to be an eight week session. Now it's going to be a six week session. And then if things get pushed back, we might only have four weeks. And so, and that's for my year coming up. So for the people who were already in it with the pandemic, everything just got taken away. And I think that that's um, something that can't be replaced online. And that's, I mean, we would all know that, you know, the distance learning does have some setbacks. And one of them is that it has no hands-on aspect. I think oh, that- one, one more, sorry, one more I thing. Guess, oh, that, oh, yeah. um, for two of my courses, so I'm taking six credits, and for uh, four of the credits, it's the intro to uh, innocent, no, in internal medicine and surgery. And because there are just so many students who are in it, it's essentially just a checklist, which I don't mind because it takes a lot of the pressure off. But I know that if I were in the hospital, it would be a lot more rigorous work. And so now I, I know, and this is whatever, this stays here, Lauren, but I know that there is nobody who's going to read, you know, 600 students answers to prompt A, you know, like, I know they're just like, as long as you turn that in, you get it, you know. And so I think that that's a little bit of a disservice because it's it's something that we are we are still really babies at and we need a lot of feedback and so we're getting this credit for something that we you know we're doing like writing you know a medical note but we don't actually know if we're doing it right and there's no way for them to really give us feedback and i understand that part but that is a drawback i'm wondering so on the student side of that right i'm wondering if you're thinking innovatively and you're thinking about just solutions oriented kind of approach there what does that look like? You know, what's a way of translating that into something that has a little more efficacy, a little more, you know, right at that point of need being able to do something? I'm curious. So my, my answer to that is your answer to everything. I'm going to use symptoms to diagnosis because that has exactly what this is all trying to get at. And that has it all written out very well. <laughs> Thank Dr. Sifu for that. He'll be really happy you've announced that on this. Um, I know that um, Dorothy is still, we're not quite able to get her in, like it seems in real time, but I'm wondering if Dorothy, I imagine you can hear us. So if you wanna just even take a look at on the chat side at the bottom of the screen where there's a little chat box near um, where it says share screen or participants, there's that little icon. If, you, if there's something you'd like to make sure that we're covering within this or, um, you know, or if you have a, you have something you'd like to add or question you'd like to raise, I would love it. You can just put it in the group chat and we can read it through and, and discuss it that way. Um, I know we're, we've got about 15 more minutes left on this call. And there's a couple questions that I wanted to ask about in terms of collaboration. Um, and so I put into the group chat, just, you know, this sort of notion how teachers in schools, we've sort of discussed this, but like, how teachers in schools, you know, they have really pretty significant design challenges that they face, right? And we just talked about one of them that Jillian just described. Um, and sort of that idea of like desynchronous lessons or designing on the fly or, or what we're, you know, doing and so forth. So the first question that I have with that is, you know, how do you define what collaboration should look like in education? And who do you think like the, the actual stakeholders are for that, right? Whether that's pre-COVID-19 or, or currently. So how do you define collaboration in education? What should that look like? And I'm not just, it can be within the classroom, but it can be within the system itself. Um, and then who are the key stakeholders and how do you modify you know, your pre-COVID-19 approach to make sure that that occurs. I, I'd love to hear what people think about that in the K-12 space relative to parents, relative to students, that type of thing. So um, curious. Um, 
I, for me, I think that one of the problems that I've identified is the key stakeholders are not those who are at risk of benefiting or not benefiting. I think that the, like, the people being taught are the key stakeholders, but I think the people that benefit from learning to collaborate are the educators. Like, I think the students are the ones who stand to gain as much as possible, have invested time or money or both in a whole variety of ways. And I think that students, for the most part, already know how to collaborate. Like, that's how we make friends. That's how we have classmates. That's all of those things is students already doing that, at least with one or two other people. And I think that the collaboration, I'm so sorry, needs to um, come like on a more administrative or a faculty or a teacher to teacher, I don't know what you call it in K through 12 um, level, because I think that there are gaps being missed. Like one of the things um, I did at my program is I was the student faculty liaison and we had to sit all the professors down and talk about like you, it was a very small program. There were 30 of us. We had to sit them down and say, you guys need to really look at your schedule of assignments because you've all said that you assign random date midterms that are on the same week. And so if you want 85 pages in one week, you're gonna get 85 bad pages. There are only five of you teaching at one time. So on our end, like, yeah, we're collaborating, we're learning, we're doing all of that. But on your end, like you need to, people need to talk to one another and realize I am not in a vacuum with my assignments or with my expectations and learning how to blend those to make a more cohesive program, I think is really important. I would, I'm going to go to Reina in a moment, but I want to ask, because I, I think yeah, you're bringing up an interesting point about collaboration, and it's sort of what we were talking about a moment ago in technology. You know, the question I think is, do we, at a metacognitive level, if you need to learn how to learn, or you need to think about your thinking, right, do you also need to learn how to collaborate? It's not, I don't think it, I, I agree, Ocean, on the one hand, as you're saying, like, there's a certainly a social component to that, that may, for some come very intuitively, very naturally, whether K-12, higher ed, but we know that for some people that's not you know, necessarily intuitive and that that would feel um, maybe really dysregulating and uncomfortable. And I think sometimes, I know in my work in medicine, the piece I have found so um, poignant is when I stop and think about all the students I get to work with, you know, each year or the residents I get to work with, and I'm, you know, in some cases, this is hundreds of students, and it's a lot over the course of 25 years. So it's a pretty neat thing that I get to, you know, do. And the narratives that I hear are often very similar in terms of you know, not feeling up to doing the task at hand or not feeling as prepared or feeling somehow less than you know, others in one's cohort. And I think sometimes just being able to put words to like saying, hey, this is a process you, let, let's just talk through what the process can look like, whether that's, you know, the preparing for a standardized exam or in the case of Ocean, what we're talking about, like with collaboration, if there's some kind of activity based, you know, learning that's going on, there may need to be instructions. There may need to be really, you know, verbally, you know, executed instructions or written instructions or video-based instruction to make sure that that's understood so that the notion of collaboration, whether it's in the classroom with teachers and students or among or between educators, I think, because that may not be as intuitive as I think often we might perceive. So I, just a thought about that. Um, it might also be because we were all therapists. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I I did want to go to Reina about this too, but I I want to throw in the last question in doing so, just to make sure um, that we get that one in. And I'm putting this down into the group chat again as well, so that everyone can take a look at it. It's um, this idea of you know what are effective ways that you've adapted your curriculum on the education side, like lesson plans, assessments, et cetera, you know, due to COVID-19 and, and it hasn't worked. And if it has, great, how? And if it hasn't, how? And I know I have a lot I could say about it, but I'm, I would love to hear what others have done and 
you know, I I'd love, I know Dorothy is, um, she and I are corresponding in the chat, but we're not doing it, you know, in real time. And so hopefully I'll get some tidbits from her in terms of what she's doing or done. Um, but, you know, for, for each of you, I guess I'd be curious to know, what did you have to do to adapt the curriculum? What did you have to do to do this differently um, on the education side, if anything? And, um, and what did it look like and how successfully did that occur? Well, I'm not teaching now. So for me personally, now I didn't have to do anything in terms of curriculum for others, but I am a student. And one thing is that I learned how to use Zoom. My Skype is terrible because my internet is like not strong enough for it. And so I've literally learned how to use a few new apps personally in order to be able to communicate and collaborate with people. Um, yeah. I think that's cool. I actually, I'm curious, because I think you were not in a place where you would have had ongoing assessments, you know, as you're preparing for step one and stuff, but um, I'm wondering in the classroom setting, what kinds of modifications have had to be made or like, you know, for as a rising M3, where you'll have a shelf exam or an OSCE or something where you'll need to be assessed. Mm -hmm. What if you're at a computer screen? What's that going to look like? Have they given you some input about that? Or Raina, maybe you have some input about that as well. I'm like, they may have, but I've only been reading the emails that pertain to me, so I don't know. <laughs> well, I know, for example, with phase one with the students, because it is a different type of curricular uh, presentation, that there have been with block exams, they're allowing the students to retake those exams just in case, because what I've noticed is that time management is becoming a huge issue simply because they're not, they have mandatory classes and I apologize, I had to take off my camera because my internet was not working great, but they're having issues with, for example, when they go on to a Zoom meeting, and by the way, Gertie, Zoom burnout exists. It's so true. I just read an article on that. But they go on to a meeting and then they take off their the face like I have right here, as you can all see. And then are they really paying attention or are they laying in bed, playing on their phone? Who knows what? And they're missing out on the rich dialogue that can actually occur um, with each one of the curricular instruction. But I do think K through 12, for example, and this is me being a mom, that the students Although they were all technologically connected, they really do miss the face-to-face -face interaction. They miss the collaborative nature that in a classroom it can provide. And although in medical school they're doing the TBL breakout room bit, it's still not the same. And I think there's a lot to be missed. And in um, one of the articles that I read about the flip model design in the medical schools, they, re they recognized that actually for first year medical students, peer support was huge in terms of actually acquiring the information. And then in the second year of medical students that they felt comfortable asking questions either of upperclassmen or of peers or of the actual faculty, which maybe they didn't feel in the first year. So we're missing out on this rich dialogue that can actually occur by doing this with Zoom, and the thing with the Zoom burnout, the problem is, is we're not getting the nonverbal cues that we need to feel like we're connecting with others, which is why we're feeling so exhausted at the end of the day. And if you get anybody who has got any kind of, of any kind of disability per se, uh, then like anything that's sensory, this is blowing them out of the water. So that's a lot of information that I just shared. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna ask, you know, Raina, in addition, like, do you feel like kind of settings like this where it's a much smaller group discussion and everyone's got the same intent is gonna lead, like lead to a more productive discussion? Because I think from like what we've found through our fireside chats is like six to eight people with a two facilitators kind of leading the conversation is a really good sweet spot for like getting the most out of all the participants because you don't want to have a big classroom where you can just cover up your camera and you're, you know, even if it's a big like university lecture, you're just in your bed and you're not paying attention. I think there's more accountability by showing face and which is why we always try and ask people to put their cameras on as well as also like, you know, being in a small group where you can get called on. I think that's the other part of it. It's like, otherwise you feel just kind of like a number, which doesn't really inspire you to want to, you know, work on anything, I think. No, and Lauren does such a great job of that. 
because she actually identifies individuals, which of course I still learn from you, Lauren, every single time we talk. Oh, but so yeah, um, well, I feel the same way. I learn from you as well. <laughs> I think that's good. I think you're kind. That. But I think just even saying, okay, I want to hear what Ocean has to say or what Jillian has to say or what Gertie has to say. I wish Dorothy could engage. And that's the thing. I mean, with the Zoom, it's better than not being able to do this. It's better than just calling in on your phone. But we're, I just worry about what's going to happen, say, six months from now, a year from now, and how it's going to demonstrate a student's lack in clinical knowledge particularly because they haven't had that engagement. That's really necessary. And with Jillian, as she was saying, she's missing out on that patient facing and interaction with other doctors. And she, I'm sorry, but assignments online are not going to make up for that. No, right. No, I absolutely. I, I think that, you know, the article that I referenced in the chat, which is this, it's from Edutopia, but what it's actually speaking to is how some kids actually really are thriving. And I, I think in medical school setting versus like in a K-12 setting, I mean, these are really different agendas and different curricula and the goals are, you know, actually quite different. But um, I think that what, what is interesting to me here, and I guess this is just an, as like a, somebody who works in educational therapy and somebody who works in, you know, a lot of standardized test preparation, I think part of what we often get into at LAS is how much of a structure, how much scaffolding should we be providing as like a medical coach or as a scholastic manager, or as a teacher or professor versus how much of that should be really self-directed and self-regulated. And uh, if we bump into you know, issues with students who have self-regulatory challenges or who have a really hard time self-organizing or self-managing, right? Is something like this where we're in an online platform and you may not be in a classroom setting where you know, teacher or professor can look out and see you and therefore engage you, or even a PBL class setting where you have to come in in a very flipped classroom sense and be prepared to participate and answer questions. I, the, the article is sort of suggesting that for some students, there's a greater level of independence that's actually been helpful and that they are finding that a percentage of their students are engaging more than they maybe ever would have, which I think is, it's interesting to note, but it raises that other question, right, which is how much support is too much, how much teaching, you know, and directing of information is too much, where do we have to pull back as educators and and pause and let there be sort of these spaces of ambiguity so that people begin to assemble processes on their own. And so, I don't know, I, it's an interesting question to maybe end on. Um, and maybe this is part of what we'll be discussing and writing about in the coming days, but thoughts? Just, uh, just in brief, as one of those uh, more atypical learners, I am definitely on the side of, in general, it's easier for me to participate virtually just because like I'm definitely hyperactive. I definitely am constantly having a lot of thoughts so I don't look like I'm paying attention, but being online allows me at any point, I got a thought, I'm gonna type it. It's gonna get seen when it's seen, it's gonna get addressed when it's addressed versus, oh, I had it, now it's gone. And so I think for me, like I studied for my MCAT online and I really do not think I would have had the same result if I'd done it in person, just because <laughs> I could be like standing up and moving around and like, all right, 15 minutes, I'm going to jog once around the pond. I'm going to be back in time. And I don't think I could have done that in person. I think that for me, this is like, <laughs> yeah, like we're good. I think also uh, somebody before was talking about like where does the onus lie in, in terms of responsibility and I think that if a student doesn't want to be present, they're not going to be present live or virtually. And while I understand that it might not be reaching everybody, if somebody's deciding to check out, that's not really on the administrative uh, part. And um, one of the frustrating things as a medical student who's much older than my peers is that is like the disrespect that I see in the classroom of people just on their phones or like talking or just really not paying attention doing new world during classes. And if that was happening, then it's not surprising to me that a huge amount are just turning off their thing and like probably leaving. But I wonder if it's actually the same percentage of students who do that in the classroom, they're just physically sitting there, even though they're not really engaged whatsoever. My one uh, question to that would be, does that necessarily mean disengagement? Like, I agree. Yeah, no, I'm that, talking like, about, I'm with you in terms yeah. of being hyper. No, these people are like, 
Like I see their thing, they're shopping for shoes. <laughs> like they're completely disengaged. Mm-hmm. And they're just complaining about the curriculum and how hard it is to be a medical student and how this is not meeting their needs. And I'm like, well, if you paid attention, maybe it would, you know? <laughs> but I'm with you in needing something to like distract yourself. No, 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 it's not that. I mean, I used I used to walk around in the back side when I would lecture in some of the larger classrooms, there'd be, you know, a couple hundred students. And so I, w- I would walk around behind as I was talking, you know, and, and most of the work I did was activity-based. It wasn't so much lecture-based. But in the early days when Facebook was like just at the beginning of like coolness, right? I would walk behind everyone have like Facebook open. I'm like, um, no, hard no. What is Facebook? You know, shut your computers. Like the experience we're having is here. It's not like behind your screen. So it's an interesting conundrum because I think um, there's got to be a balance there. And yeah, I think that's that's a good point. You know, whether there's a need for fidgety and you know distractibility to like have that as an outlet versus how far away does that take you from the task at hand or from the you know information you're learning. So, yeah, I do that very same thing, Lauren, where I'd walk around, and eventually my students understood that they're not going to be able to do that surfing for shoes because that was the huge thing or prom dresses because I'd walk around and who knows when I would be coming by and and it would be really quick and I just designed my class that it had chairs together like desks together as cooperative groups but that I could go to any desk within five seconds and it was just something that kept engagement going so yeah, no, I think that's cool. I think um, I know we're at the time mark, and so I, I'm going to let Gert kind of slow us down and, and stop us. But I think um, the other piece, and this is maybe something I'm planting a seed for for future here, but I think there's another component to it, which is that this has allowed for a more decompressed schedule for a lot of our students, um, uh, K through 12, higher ed, med ed, health science education. Um, without a doubt. And I think actually as parents, as employees, as employers, I think it's allowed at times for a more decompressed schedule, not always by the way, but, um, and that's kind of cool. So I don't know. So Gerd, I'm going to let you sort of wind us down and um, and go. I mean, I knew when we got on this chat, it was going to be a good talk. And I feel like here we are an hour later and I've got like three full pages of notes that you guys should definitely check out at the bottom of this agenda. Um, This has been an awesome discussion. And I feel like, you know, as somebody who also has pretty bad ADHD, like I have definitely struggled with um, being in an in-person in classroom experience. And I think a lot of like working virtually has shown me that like I have the freedom to like take a bike ride during my day and that helps me get my energy out. And that's something that maybe as educators, that's important to like really like stress to your students. It's like, it's okay to take a 20 minute break and go take a few laps around the block. Like you might need that. And and that, I think the other thing too, is like, if you are going to be doing like a big kind of classroom discussion with 30 students in it, it's like maybe try and do that like once a week and otherwise try and keep it small because I think you're going to end up with a bunch of kids that, you know, get lost in the fray. And I think being on a chat like this, where there's six of us and we can all see each other and it's sort of like we each are held accountable to contribute in some way that will probably foster a more, you know, meaningful and solution driven conversation. And so um, I think, you know, we figured that out on this chat that that can be solved and hopefully there's, you know, skill sets and tools that educators can implement and whether that's through fireside at five and teachers want to try and have their students like, register for these kind of chats. I, I think at, like, like at least at the university level, I don't see why professors wouldn't say, hey, go f- sign up for two fireside chats a month. And that's part of your assignment is just collaborating with other people. And I think like that could be a really cool and new way to, to do education. It's not as much of like book smart, but it's street smart and it's social skills and social interactions. And I think that's what a lot of students are missing. It's like, you don't bump into your friends in the hallway anymore. So how do you meet strangers in this setting? How do you continue to like learn those social skills? And I wish Dorothy was still on here from an educational therapist perspective, but like, you know, I think there's something about meeting people in public and strangers and making new friends. And like, those are also skill sets, not necessarily hard skills, but soft skills that students still need to learn in some way. So I, that's another thing I want to plant the seed about. It's not just like the book smart, but the street smart and like all of those social components that you get from school as well. 
Um, yeah, you're hundred percent right. I feel like we could talk forever on that. Though. We certainly could. And I would. I was on a fireside chat last earlier in the week that Jay Craney had done. That was excellent. And I took a lot of notes. But one of the one of the takeaways on that was was sort of on this topic too of just you know, how we are coming together to collaborate in this sort of space, et cetera, and like move something forward in a kind of organic way. You don't really know where it's gonna go. You can put the structures in place. You can, you know, provide enough of the information. But at the end of the day, like when we come in here, this is our responsibility. Like we have to care for it. And, you know, Jillian and I were talking a little bit about that earlier in the week as well in the debrief of just sort of like, where do you go with this? What do you do with something like this? And I think already that there's opportunity in education. Maybe this is the incremental innovation, which is to be able to actually put more of that social emotional back into the experience and to be able to process, you know, where people are in their learning, both at a metacognitive level, but at a psychological level, so that there is the support and there's a way to say, it's okay to talk about this. This is fine. And, and if we can put vocabulary to this and language to it, then you know what, maybe that's going to do a lot more good than bad. It's not going to be so challenging the next time I'm in public and I need to stand up in the back and walk around a little bit before, you know, the lecture's actually over or whatever. So yeah. So. And I think too, like having maybe like a social worker from the school sit in on some of the like larger lectures and give the teacher some notes about how they can better engage the students from like an EQ perspective, not just IQ as well. Like, I think that there are definitely a lot of strategies that we could probably implement across the board. The problem is, is there's no one clear place to go find those strategies. And so I guess what I'm going to propose to the group is how can we put with all the notes that I've taken, are there tidbits? Are there other things that we can kind of put into an infographic and learn academic services can put on their website and send out to schools and say, this is what we recommend from a virtual learning platform. This is what we think works best. And we recommend you testing this out and seeing how it goes. So I think that's something that hopefully we can be custodians of and move forward on. Sounds awesome. Um, I just yeah. want to thank you guys again also for joining on a Friday. I know, you know, right before Memorial Day weekend, it's, you know, hard. There's a lot of fun things to do. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but, all my vacation plans just come on. Wow. I'm going to go mow the lawn now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Wow. You're getting outside. <laughs> it's sunny. We have like one more day of sun before the flooding comes back or whatever. Yeah, here too. <laughs> um, but you guys, thank you so much. And again, this was live stream. So we've got a recording of it. And if you guys are interested in kind of watching it back, I'm happy to send that out to you guys. And thank you. It was Yay. awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Nice Thanks. getting to we'll talk be to back you. back for our final May chat on disenfranchised grief. And we'll be talking about what it means to miss the milestones um, within education and, you know, what that's been like for all, all kinds of students. So mm -hmm. um, thank you for participating. Yeah. Great. Have a great weekend, y'all. Yeah. You guys too. Bye. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.